Welcome to Real News, and I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you all with us. And this is another one of our continuing stories of the end of the year wrap-up to see what's been happening in the past, where it may take us in the future. So it's also a good time to wish you all a happy holidays. And we are once again with Sher Hever, who is our correspondent, who lives in Heidelberg, Germany, uh, joining us for the second part of our conversation, where we're looking at Israel and Palestine, and focusing now on the corruption charges against Netanyahu and what that might mean. And the annexation of the Jordan Valley, if that happens in the next year, what could that explode? And what's all this, how is all this connected to world populism? So, Shir, as usual, good to have you back. Thank you, Mike. So let's start with your favorite person, Benjamin Netanyahu, <laughs> and talk about these corruption charges um, that have been part of the news for a while, but they're now they're really tied up because of the battle over who's going to be the next prime minister and who's going to head the Likud party. So give us... Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of the background, but look into your crystal ball. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think uh, Transparency International uh, uh, they found that forty percent of all populist leaders around the world have uh, charges of corruption pressed against them. In some way, you need to have a corruption case in order to be a populist leader because <laughs> that's how you can get into a fight with the judicial system, with the police and the media and claim that they're all conspiring against you. And without that, you're not a real populist. So Netanyahu uh, <laughs> obviously needed those, those corruption cases against him. And he used them uh, and, and squeezed them for the last drop. But at some point, um, the judicial system has, has put its foot down. And now it looks like um, the charges are going to be pressed and, and the evidence is overwhelming. Um, I think uh, what, what specifically the uh, jail time that he could be facing is up to 10 years in jail. Uh, but uh, in every likelihood, it's going to be less than that. But just, but, but even one day in jail means that you'll have to not be the prime minister anymore. And, and so that's probably a, a what we're facing. Uh, and, and they're delaying the charges again and again. And now they're probably going to delay them until after the elections of March. Uh, but once the election doesn't give Netanyahu a clear majority, then uh, he will have to ask the Knesset for immunity. The Knesset might not give it to him uh, because he, uh, uh, he might not have enough of a majority. And in that case, uh, his, his political career is pretty much over. So make this connection for us. I mean, th there's a huge difference between the Israel right-wing moves and what's happening in the countries we, we talked about in the last segment for a moment, in Brazil and, uh, uh, and Eastern Europe and Hungary and, and, and Modi in India. There's a difference. I mean, Israel also has an occupying force and there's other things going on there as well. So what's the connection uh, for you with Netanyahu and this world movement, one of the things you've said in the past is that Netanyahu is almost like a pioneer in terms of moving this worldwide populist movement, right-wing movement ahead. So talk a bit about that. Netanyahu uh, became a pioneer by selling an asset that maybe a lot of Israelis didn't quite realize that they have, which is uh, that is the state of Israel can pretend to be the representative of the Jewish people around the world. And when Netanyahu goes around the world, he doesn't present himself just as the prime minister of Israel. He says, I'm the leader of the Jewish people. Even though, you know, the Jewish people never elected him and never wanted him to be their leader, but that doesn't matter. For world leaders from the far right part of the political spectrum, that's wonderful. Because then they can make deals with Netanyahu and say, we're going to say that we're pro-Israel, we're going to oppose the BDS movement, we're going to uh, support you in the UN or in the European Union and so on. And in exchange, you're going to do a little photo opportunity with us, come and visit us, and legitimize us, even though we are representing parties that have deep roots in anti-Semitism and racism and so on. Uh, but then we're going to say, you know, we, we're not really anti-Semites because we support the state of Israel. Uh, and that's what we hear constantly from Trump, from Bolsonaro, from Orban, from Modi, uh, that their support of the state of Israel is cover for the racism that they want to have in their own countries. The difference, of course, is that uh, in Israel, this racism is legally entrenched on a much, much deeper level than in any other country in the world. Uh, because you have an, an, an official apartheid system with people of different uh, levels of representation that don't even have the right to vote and that don't have the right of freedom of movement. That's the reason that uh, Netanyahu's populism, in the end, can only uh, uh, galvanize a very certain part of the population. Only the people who are in his ethnic, national, religious group can actually support him. Uh, and because of that, I think there's also a limit to how much power, power he can gain through uh, populism, while in countries like Hungary, 
Uh, if Viktor Orban is able to galvanize the majority of white Christian Hungarians, well, they are already pretty much the, the right. overwhelming majority of the country. Uh, and then we're looking at uh, the beginning of, of fascism, which in Israel we don't see. And it also explains in some ways what we saw here in the United States a few weeks ago when Trump was uh, talking to the um, Maryland, uh, American Israeli Committee, which is made up of mostly Israelis who now live in the United States, where when he, despite his anti-Semitic tirade, he was cheered. Uh, and they were chan chan chanting 12 more years for Trump. I mean, I mean those connections um, are, 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 are really becoming exposed. And I think what you're describing describes why that happened here in this country when he was talking to that group, when Trump was talking to that group. Yeah, well, the people who cheered don't really represent American Jews. No, know? no, absolutely. No, no, they, uh, they do not. They, they do not. They, 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 they do not. Right, uh, right. The thing is that that uh, a lot of Israeli journalists, uh, uh, a lot of American journalists like Peter Beinart are saying, well, Netanyahu's policy is ruining the ties between the state of Israel and Jewish communities around the world, especially in the United States. He has humiliated them, abused them, and they no longer support the state of Israel because of what Netanyahu did. Netanyahu's response to this is, who cares? You know, I don't, I don't care about Jewish communities around the world. I care about uh, um, governments like Bolsonaro or Orban or Trump that can support me, uh, uh, even if it means alienating all the world's Jews. So one last final question here. We, the, we, the annex, both the major parties in Israel, the blue and white, Benny Gantz and the Likud, um, all support the annexation of the Jordan Valley. Now, if that actually happens, if Israel actually officially annexes the Jordan Valley, the most kind of fertile region uh, in, the, in the entire of Israel-Palestine, um, th th this could cause a huge reaction internationally as well as internally in Israel. So again, go to your crystal ball. What would happen? What do you think is going to happen when this happens? Because I think it is going to happen. The International Criminal Court of Justice in The Hague actually held a discussion specific about this question. And they said that this would actually um, warrant uh, the, the um, pressing charges against senior Israeli officials in the military and also in civilian institutions for the uh, war crime of illegally annexing occupied territory. That's the consequence. And as a result of that, the state attorney office of Israel has issued a warning to Netanyahu, don't fulfill your campaign promise and don't annex that territory because we, as uh, lawyers working for the government, may not be able to travel to Europe anymore. We could be arrested. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's where we talk about the consequences. But, you know, uh, we have to say that uh, on, on the ground, the Jordan Valley has already been annexed. No, that's That's, clear. that's the reality. Right, right. It used to be a place where a quarter of a million Palestinians lived until 1967, uh, producing food, uh, for the whole region. Uh, and uh, today there are about 50,000 Palestinians living there, 53 years later, after a very slow but methodical ethnic cleansing. There are only about 9,000 Israeli colonists in that area. Uh, uh, but they have taken over virtually all the water, the best fertile land, access to the Jordan River, uh, and they get government subsidies, and they produce uh, um, agricultural products that are then labeled falsely as if they were made in Israel and exported to other countries around the world. Right, right. This is also actually something that uh, is causing a lot of controversy and, and the European Union decided that they are not going to allow that anymore. But uh, how are they going to enforce it when the companies are lying, the Israeli government is lying? So the Jordan Valley is already under a very heavy boot of the Israeli military uh, and, and officially uh, annexing it uh, doesn't going to, uh, it isn't going to change very much except to signal the fact that all of this talk about two-state solution is something that the Israeli government is not even paying lip service to anymore. And that, that is an important step. Well, on another day, we'll talk about that. I think the two-state may be dead on arrival at this moment. <laughs> so, but we'll, we'll explore that in another day. And I think that looking again uh, in a deeper way at the Jordan Valley um, would be a, a story that needs to be told because it's emblematic of the entire occupation. It's at the heart of it. So, yeah. sure, Heather, thank you so much uh, for joining us here and giving us a review thank of you, what's Mark. been happening over the last year and what may be happening in the future. Have a happy new year, and we'll talk thank to you, you soon. We'll talk to you soon. And a happy new year to everyone out there. I hope you're having enjoying your holiday season. And I'm Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Take care. Have a great year. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. 
hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on our videos.